everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. We're at Professional Physical Therapy, and we're going to talk a little bit today is Bob McCabe. So Bob is a physical therapist who works with us, started about a couple months ago, and Bob is kind of interesting for me because he's an education person, he's taught, he's got a little experience like I do, which is kind of nice to have that discussion. So just going to talk a little bit. Welcome, Bob. Thanks for joining us. Tell us about yourself, more, a little bit of background, where you came from. Yeah, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, so my background is I've been working about 30 years, <clears throat> 25, 30, almost 30 years in uh, physical therapy. And uh, so I've, I've worked in pretty much uh, orthopedic and sports medicine practices, both hospital-based as well as uh, private practice-based, and um, even the military uh, for a period of time, which mm -hmm. was a, a whole separate experience. Yeah. But in all three uh, environments, I worked uh, with orthopedic and sports. It's kind of my passion. I, I like the shoulder, but I enjoy all body parts, yeah. but the shoulder is something oh, so that I'm So we're down in Birmingham for a little bit? I did. I worked down in... Um, with uh, under the direction of Dr. James Andrews in uh, Pensacola, Florida. Um, so uh, it was a very unique experience because we had um, the hospital uh, set up right there along with a performance center. And uh, so I got to see the patients from post-op day one all the way through uh, therapy and, and even through performance uh, and end stage uh, therapy and, and then bridging the gap to more performance type of training. It's so a real unique opportunity. And then in Lenox Hill for a little bit. And then I worked in Lenox Hill prior to that. I was in Lenox Hill, uh, which uh, and worked with some uh, fabulous uh, surgeons there uh, over the years and, and excellent therapists. That what I, was the military uh, like? That's an interesting one. The military is quite different. Uh, one of the the military was really um, a true direct access environment. So um, being the the point of entry into the healthcare system. Uh, we operated without referrals from doctors. Um, <clears throat> virtually everybody came in without a diagnosis or without a prescription. So there was a lot of responsibility, actually, to refer patients to uh, a specialist or, uh, for example, for an x-ray or for further consultation if it was something that um, I felt like was beyond my expertise or if the patient was not responding as you would expect. You think school prepared you well for direct access? I, I, when I, I, school. <laughs> I think it did not. <laughs> at, my, at the time that I went to school, there was not a strong emphasis on differential diagnosis. And now I know that has changed. The recent graduates coming up today are probably much more prepared. Um, my, through experience, though, uh, I did, in, did learn to, to uh, really hone my differential diagnos diagnostic skills. Yeah. And they definitely got better through experience. But as far as entry level, I think the uh, the current graduates coming out of school today are definitely <laughs> better prepared than our generation you know, 20, 30 yeah, years ago. What would you tell young therapists to talk about direct access? Like right now, if someone comes in from what your experience was, what, how would you pick out that person that's just not right for us? Is there a, a certain criteria you did in the, in the military that said, you know, you might not be mine, let's move you to someone else? Or I think it's really important to know your basic flags, yellow and red flags, and to, to really use that as, <clears throat> as your first uh, kind of safeguard. Um, and if you follow the yellow and red flags, and, and for example, if a patient has uh, you know, constant pain, just to throw out one particular red flag, or if it's a pain that doesn't, is not related to any pattern of movement or activity, that's a red flag that would uh, warrant, a, if not an outright referral back to a physician, or to a, uh, a specialist, at least having that discussion. Yeah, red uh, flags seem like the, I mean, they're definite points, but how about yellow flags? Like, what kind of things would you look for? What yeah, the, more of the yellow flags uh, for me would be um, psychological related flags. So, um, fear avoidance, uh, patients that have catastrophizing uh, fear avoidance behavior. Fortunately, in the military, I did not see too much of that. Most of these guys were. <laughs> We're not. Um, I want to get back. I want to get. You know, back. they're very type A, aggressive type type of people, and they they didn't really have a lot of fear. But in the clinic, I would say I, I, I come across that more often. More of these uh, fear avoidance behaviors. Now, from all your experience, all the years, what kind of advice would you give young therapists coming out? If you were coming out again, would you what would you do different? Well, I think you know you could learn in a private practice or a hospital. Um, 
in even a physician-owned practice. I, I don't think there's one facility that you can paint a brush, a general rule, and say you should never go work in that particular environment. I think it all comes down to the support system that you have around you, whether it be fellow therapists, uh, whether it be orthopedic surgeons um, in a hospital, you have more of that kind of uh, relationship with surgeons, which is excellent. Um, but even if you can have uh, in a private practice setting, if you're surrounded by strong mentors, I think that's really important to look for mm -hmm. and uh, and see if that that. And how do you do teaching? How do you get into the teaching world? I know you've done some. Well, it was just by accident. I had uh, <clears throat> saw that there was an advertisement for a uh, a seminar, uh, so they were looking for instructors. So they asked uh, for some interest. I put a PowerPoint together and I shipped it off. Didn't hear anything for about four weeks, and then out of the blue, I get a call saying that, "Hey, we got your PowerPoint. We'd like you to uh, to you know do a dry run, so to speak, and teach this course." And then I just I just uh, really started enjoying it. So I went out and did my first one. I got to say, the feedback I got on my initial one was. A lot of negative and a lot of positive <laughs> mixed in. So there was a lot of people that were saying, I'll, you know, this course lacked to this. And, I, you know, I gave it a low rating. And, and that happened for the first several courses. Uh, it took quite a while before I uh, gradually improved it. And it's, it's just like anything. It's a, it's a skill, but it's, it's not a natural talent. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, an, it's not something that uh, – it's something that you can improve quite a bit and something I worked at for quite – quite a long time to get right. better at. You enjoy it? I like yeah. it. I really yeah. do. Yeah, teaching is really excellent. And, and uh, you know, especially when you're working with, um, you know, higher level or, you know, higher level professional education because the people that attend that tend to be pretty motivated to uh, to learn from you. Right. Not, not just to check off the box, so to right. speak. So <laughs> therapists, let's say, you're, you know, as a senior clinician, you see a young therapist come in, what kind of guidance... Uh, would you give them? You know, I know it's the mentorship, but how would you mentor somebody? Yeah, I think it's depending on the person. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, you know, type one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, direct teaching is, I think, really important, especially um, role-playing or even just uh, sitting down and asking them what what they would like to work on, rather than just. Us, you know, teaching. provide assignments and, and lectures, and those things are important, as well as formal lab sessions. But uh, actually going through and uh, pretending uh, to be a patient and going through a mock evaluation. Interesting part you say that because we talked about with our, our residency all the time. Like, we've always wanted to teach, 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 and all of a sudden you realize the mentoring, the one-on-one -on -one that we get. I think our, our residents, so Frank will tell us, like 150 hours of mentoring, which is huge, and see the difference that people have been mentored. You could learn from a book. So, um, what kind of um, mentors have you had in your life that made a difference or certain people who just said made you go to the next level? Yeah, I, I think that just to get back to your other mm -hmm. point, I think that's true because in a classroom, uh, some, sometimes um, we don't really, we teach, but it's passive learning. So it's sitting down and taking the information in, whereas a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program is more of a, kind of a two-way active mm -hmm. process. Uh, for me, uh, some mentors that I've had over the years were, uh, well, in Lenox Hill, he's an employee of this company, actually, Ben Gelfand, which is one of the uh, mm -hmm. directors of the clinical education I learned uh, from him. Uh, so I learned uh, down in, uh, with some fabulous surgeons, um, and that would be, again, at Lenox Hill, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Nicholas uh, Jr., I had a chance to, to work at, at the Lenox Hill Hospital, and he was uh, very much into education. And then just uh, some some outstanding physical therapists over the years that mm -hmm. uh, that I worked with, and I learned their techniques. And what I've done is I kind of combined what I've learned from a lot of those clinicians over the years. I sort of combined what I felt like was the most intriguing and the, and the most effective treatments, and then Right. So we so see how the young therapist can get, you know, what do you do with older guys like us? What's your kind of guidance for some people who have been around for a while? Um, 
<clears throat> as far as uh, um, education, and do you stop, or do you, do you have enough, or do you keep going, or who do you find, and what do you do, and how do you keep it interesting? Right. I think it's uh, it's really important to go out and talk to people and find out what courses really have a good reputation. There's a lot of courses out there that are not really evidence-based courses, and I'm not a purist by any means. I don't have to learn everything from uh, a purely evidence. I think there's an art to this profession too. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really important to go out and just to talk to people, go on social media, look for reviews of courses, look for the popularity of courses. Um, and that, that speaks volumes if, if a course is, is doing, uh, really gaining a lot of traction and attracting a lot of um, a lot of students, it's usually for a good reason. Uh, and of course, marketing helps, but the content has to be good without the marketing. If the content is uh, not up to par, not valuable, then even the best marketing in the world it, uh, won't be a good course. Good. Anything, any last parting comments at all? No, it's uh, great to be uh, part of a progressive company like Professional. And uh, I just enjoy uh, teaching as well as uh, treating and kind of combining the two of those. And sure. I look forward in the mind of in the future bringing you back for some shoulder, some hip stuff, some other, and we'll, we'll talk more. Great. Great. Thanks for joining me. Okay. And Thank it's uh, Rob Shapiro from In the Mind of.